Beautiful. Good morning. So good to see everyone this morning. Welcome to worship. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. We come into the presence of the God who hears our call. Yes, Lord. Walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. This is the Lord. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The opening hymn is My Soul. Praise the Lord. suffering. When will God hear us call? When will God act on our behalf? How soon, O oh Lord, join me in the prayer of confession. Forgive, Forgive us, us, Father, Father when, when your, your timing, timing is, is not our, our timing. Forgive, Forgive us when we think we know all the right answers. answers. Forgive, Forgive us when we question you, you when, when we act as though we are sovereign, sovereign and you must do our bidding. bidding. Forgive us and, and speak, speak quiet, quiet words, words of reminder, of reminder into, into our, our lives. 
Grant, grant us, us patience. patience. Grant us understanding. Grant us trust. Amen. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance. The prophet Micah says, Who is a God like you who pardons sins and forgives transgressions? He does not stay angry forever, but delights to show us mercy. And Isaiah assures us that our God is gracious to us. He is our strength every morning and our salvation. Believe this good news. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Pass the peace to one another. Peace, peace with be with you. <laughs> Please be seated. And I'd like to invite the children down for the children's message. How are you doing? Great. Is that a beaver stuffed animal? Wow. Look at that. That's beautiful. Nice. OK, I have a question for you. Raise your hand if you like to wait. You like to wait. You like waiting. Good. And raise your hand if you don't like to wait. Yep, I'm with you. I don't like to wait either. But so much of the time we have to wait, don't we? For so many things, like if you go with your parents to the grocery store and you're taking your cart up to the, the cash register, usually you have to wait because there's other people in front of you in the line at the cash register, right? And it can kind of be boring to stand there and wait and wait and wait for everybody to get their carts through the line. Or have you ever gone on a family trip you're, you're in the car, you're going somewhere fun, and it's just you have to wait so long before you can get to the spot. And you, maybe you're asking, like, when are we going to be there? It's, it's long and it's boring, right? Well, we're waiting for something else. Do you remember I showed you an egg two weeks ago? Do you remember that? And I said I was going to put that egg in an incubator, and I was going to show you the progress of the egg each week. So I put it in the incubator, and I candled it, which means shining a light onto the egg to see if it's developing. And last week, this is what the egg looked like. So I'm just going to show you this here. This was after a few days, maybe four days, of being in the incubator. You see? That's the little embryo right there. <clears throat> see that? And now, seven days later, this is what it looks like. There's a tiny chick growing inside the egg. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? You can see the beak. Can you see the eyes? Yeah. And the feet? Yeah. And so we have 14 more days before the chick is going to hatch, we hope. 14 days. That's a long time. What's happening in 14 days? Does anybody know? Two weeks from now. Easter, that's right. So next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and then we have Holy Week, and then we have Easter. But we have to wait for Easter, right? There's a passage in the Bible, Psalm 27, that says, be calm, wait for the Lord. So what we need to do is, that means be quiet, be calm, and have patience, and wait for the Lord. So much of our faith is about waiting. So let's say a prayer. God, we ask you to give us patience to wait, because so much of our faith we know is about waiting. You ask us to wait and be patient, be calm, be still, and just wait. So give us that peace and patience to wait, God, for prayers to be answered. Sometimes we don't think they're being answered, but they are being answered. It's just your answer is wait sometimes. So give us that patience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you can go to your Sunday school rooms. The hymn is number 60, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Please be seated. This morning is the last Sunday, a few announcements, the last Sunday to order Easter flowers in memory of loved ones. If you're interested in ordering flowers for Easter, you can find a, a form at the kiosk that you can fill out. This coming Wednesday is our last Lenten supper. That's Wednesday, April 6th at 6.15 p.m. Those have been great times of fellowship together. We'll have a some worship together, we'll do a craft. Cindy has been preaching these incredible devotions, and then we'll have a, a discussion group. So that's Wednesday at 6.15. On Saturday, this coming Saturday, April 9th, from 11.30 to 12.30, we'll have an Easter egg hunt at the uh, youth house. And the Sakandaga family retreat is May 20th through 22nd. You can sign up at the kiosk um, in the uh, fellowship hall. And there's more information also on the website. Our God is gracious to attend to our needs. He wants to see our church rebound and to see people worshiping together. He wants to see our young people being led into deeper relationships with him. He wants all our children to be nourished spiritually. Our offerings and our gifts make that possible. Give as the Lord requires of you. Praise to the 
creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Father, as we draw closer and closer to Easter, we think of the sacrifice you made on our behalf. Our love for you has drawn us to this place. Accept these gifts and offerings as we strive to make your love known in our church and in our community. Amen. And as we go to God in prayer this morning, do you have any joys or concerns that you'd like to, to raise for the congregation? I'll start with one joy. Um, ben and Christine Harrington, Harrington last Monday, um, their daughter was born, Cecilia Alice, March 28th. So that's great news. And she was healthy. Also, we had, we'd been praying for that, um, for that birth. Christine was scheduled to go in for a C-section on Monday morning, but when she arrived, the baby had already turned and her head was in the right position, so they didn't need to do the C-section, but they, she gave birth naturally. So that's an answer to prayer. Wonderful, wonderful news. Also, we, thank, uh, we give God praise and thanks for Karen Shogren passing her social work license. So that's also great news. Any other joys this morning? Judy. Wonderful. Happy birthday. <laughs> That's beautiful. Any other joys? Sarah and I also have the joy of celebrating our parents' birthdays today. Her dad and mom have birthdays at the same time, and my dad's birthday is only a couple days after, so we're having major amounts of birthday cake and partying today, uh, this afternoon. Um, any concerns this morning? Jay. Continued prayers for George Wallen and his struggles physically. So continued prayers for George. Yes, continued prayers for Haley Skorlick. So she uh, had a head injury last week, and the doctors are confident that she'll make a full recovery. But she had to stay home from school this week, and uh, she's it's it's slow going. It's going to take some time. So it was a severe um, concussion. So please. Pray for Haley's full recovery and for Kim and Brian. Any other concerns? Family of Joe Wilson. Yeah, please keep in prayer the family of Joe Wilson. Joe uh, passed away on Thursday, and uh, after a long struggle, um, he had congestive heart failure. And um, please pray for Carol and their children. We'll, we'll announce also when that funeral will be it will probably be in a couple of weeks please also pray this is from Linda Byrne pray for seven-year-old Olivia who has a stomach disorder let's go to God in prayer yeah Prayers for Anise Grace, who broke her arm. Okay. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask you to please send your Holy Spirit, your life-giving Spirit, to all of the people that we've mentioned. Bring your healing presence into their sickness to heal them. And also, God, bring your comfort for everyone who's grieving. In a moment of silence now, we lift up in our hearts those who who we know are in need of prayer, we silently lift these up in a moment of prayer.
Hear our prayer, Lord. You've asked that when we carry burdens, God, that we can give them over to you. We can unburden ourselves and give our troubles to you, give our concerns to you. And we also see all kinds of signs around us that prayer works, that prayer has power. We see the signs of healing around us. We see evidence that prayer works. Sometimes we lose faith in that. It's easy for us to forget how important prayer is. So help us to remember again and to see again the importance of prayer. God, this morning we also pray that every human heart, that you will move in our hearts, that the barriers which divide us may crumble at the foot of the cross, that suspicions may disappear, that hatreds may dissolve in our country and in the world, and that all the divisions would be healed so that we may live in the reign of your peace. God, we also pray this morning for our missionaries. In particular, we pray for Holly Nelson and her family who serve with a special, a special hope network in Zambia, which is a ministry for children with special needs. God, we pray for you to bless Holly and her family and, and their mission in Zambia. Bless those children. And God, we continue to pray for war to cease. We pray for an end to the violence between Russia and Ukraine. We pray for peace. We pray for your comfort to be and provision to be with the refugees. And God, we pray for the, the independence and the democracy to be preserved in the Ukraine. And Lord, now we, we pray that prayer that you taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And join me in prayer as we open the Holy Scripture this morning and as we seek to be instructed by God's Word. Let us pray for illumination. Lord, over so many centuries, the lives of the prophets are still touching us. Their stories are still inspiring us. They still encourage us, challenge us, and convict us. Teach us this morning, God, through this story of Elijah, through your holy word, renew us and use us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, throughout the Sundays of Lent, we've been preaching through the stories of the prophet Elijah, which can be found in the first book of Kings, chapters 16, 17, and 18, 19 also, and some stories beyond that in 20, and other parts of the uh, Old Testament. So this is the point um, in the story where Elijah climbs back to the top of Mount Carmel and the rains finally come after a three and a half year drought. Hear the word of the Lord as it is written for us in the first book of Kings, chapter 18, verses 41 to 46. Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and he bent down to the ground and he put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And his servant went and looked. There is nothing there, his servant said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. And the seventh time the servant reported a cloud as small as a man's hand rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, Hitch up your chariot, go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, and a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. Then the power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Here ends the reading of God's word for us this morning. May God help us as we seek to understand these words. Okay, so you might remember last week in the stories of Elijah, we came to the pinnacle of the story. Elijah's whole purpose was to bring the people of Israel back to worshiping the Lord 
because they had drifted away. They had begun worshiping another God alongside God, which is forbidden by God. God does not, God does not accept that we can worship anything other than God. But the people of Israel, even the king, King Ahab, began to worship Baal. Baal was the false god of rain. And so Israel had gotten completely off track worshiping Baal. Now Elijah, his whole purpose was to bring people back to the worship of God. And he thought the way to do this is through a drought, because if the people are praying to the god of rain, the false god of rain, during a drought, they will eventually see that that's the false god, and they'll come back and worship the Lord. But that strategy had not worked. So last week we read how Elijah gathered the people of Israel up onto Mount Horeb, along with the prophets of Baal, and he began to preach to them directly. But that did not work. So then Elijah set up a contest. He said, you, the worshipers of Baal, set up a, an altar to Baal, pray to Baal, and see if he brings fire down upon the altar. And I'll do the same for the Lord. I'll build an altar to the Lord. I'll call fire upon the altar from the Lord. And if fire comes down, that will prove that the Lord is God. So they did that contest, and the worshipers of Baal prayed and asked for Baal to send fire down, but there was no response. And then Elijah called fire upon the altar from the Lord, and the Lord sent fire upon the altar, and all who saw it were amazed, and it says that they bowed down, and they began to worship the Lord. They said, the Lord, he is God. And so true worship in the Lord was restored, as we, re as we read last week. This story comes right after that, and so it's curious that we begin the story. Elijah, by the way, he's just succeeded in bringing, restoring true worship to Israel. He's brought the people of Israel back to the true worship of the Lord. So why is he despondent? Look at the way this passage begins. It says, Elijah climbed the top of Mount Carmel again. Then he bent to the ground and he put his face between his knees. That is a posture of shame and despair. And there are two reasons for that. The first is, there was another line between these two stories that we didn't read last week, and that is after true worship, after Israel comes back and starts worshiping the Lord, it said that Elijah gathered up the prophets of Baal and he killed them. And then Elijah felt great shame for this horrible act of violence. So that's part of what's happening here, and we see in chapter 19 where it says that Elijah is in so much despair that he asks God that he might die. He says, it's enough, Lord, take my life away, for I am no better than my ancestors. But on top of his shame for the horrendous act that's just happened, he's also feeling despair because his prayer is not being answered. The drought is over. There's no more reason for the drought. The people of God have returned to the worship of the Lord. So Elijah's asking rain to come down, but the rain has not come. And maybe it's also a posture of waiting. He's waiting for the blessing of the Lord, but the blessing is just not coming. And so he asks his servant, he says, go and look to the sea. Now, why is he asking him to look to the sea? If you're on Mount, Hor uh, Mount Carmel in Israel, Mount Carmel, that mountain range goes right up to the coast of Israel, and you can see the Mediterranean Sea from the top of Mount Carmel. And what Elijah knew is that when the seasonal rains come, they always come from the southwest. So he's saying, look west across the sea. Look for the sign of blessing that we've been praying for, but is just not coming. So his servant looks. He scans the horizon, but he sees nothing. So he comes back to Elijah and he says, I looked. I looked out across the sea to the west. And I saw nothing. But Elijah says to him, go back. Look again. So his servant goes back and looks again. Looks at the horizon, looking for any sign of a rain cloud that might be coming. Nothing. So his servant goes back to Elijah and says, there's nothing there. Elijah says, go back, look again. A third time, his servant goes out, scans the horizon, looks again, nothing but blue sky. He comes back, Elijah, honestly, there's nothing there. And what does Elijah say to him? 
Did you see it in the story? Go back. Go back. Look again. So he goes back a fourth time. The fourth time he comes back, he says, Elijah, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. I've looked. Elijah says, go back and look again. The fifth time he goes back. And this time he looks and he sees nothing. So he comes back to Elijah. With all due respect, sir, there's nothing there. Elijah says, go back and look again. A sixth time, a seventh time. It's not till the seventh time, which, by the way, is a symbolic number in the Bible, meaning a very, very long time. He goes back again and again, and finally on the seventh time it says he sees a tiny cloud way in the distance, and it's so small that it's barely recognizable as the blessing that they're looking for. And in fact, it doesn't look anything like a rain cloud. Instead, in the passage, it says it looks like a man's hand way off in the distance. Sometimes we have to wait so long, longer than you can imagine, for our blessings to materialize, for the things that we've prayed for to materialize, to begin to emerge. And then when they do, often they're not even recognizable as what we thought we were looking for. The rain cloud appears first as a man's hand. I wonder if that's a reference to the hand of God. But it's not recognizable. I want to share a story with you this morning, a story about my long wait for my heart's desire. Ever since I was a, a small boy, I always knew that I wanted to be married, and I always thought that I'd be married at the age of 25, but the age of 25 came and went. And then I went to seminary, and after seminary I was serving as a pastor. I was in my early 30s serving a church, and let me tell you, dating women in New York State when you're a pastor, is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult to find someone who's interested in dating a pastor. But I finally did meet someone when I was in my early 30s, very nice woman. We dated for a while, then we got engaged, except that my parents and my friends said, there are red flags here. And I didn't want to see the red flags, and so they eventually were right, the red flags were, were there, and the engagement broke up. And that was a painful chapter for me. And then I went off to serve as a missionary. Being a Christian missionary in a Muslim-majority country was not a great place to look for a wife. <laughs> and so that didn't work. And I remember being about 45 years old, and I came back on one of those trips, and I was visiting with my parents, and I said, I just can't believe I've been praying for years every day for God to bring my wife to me, for, for God to bring us together, and it just hasn't happened. And my parents said, don't worry, don't worry, it's going to happen in time, it'll happen when the time is right. And then three years later, when I was about 48, I was visiting my parents again, and I said, well, it still hasn't happened. It's been another three years, and I'm still single, and I still haven't met anyone. And shockingly, my dad said, well, not everyone gets married. <laughs> and then he said, you know, you've been out in the world doing great things as a missionary. Maybe you've married the world. And I thought, no, that, my own parents gave up on me. <laughs> and I figure if I calculate this right, from about the age of 23 to about the age of 51, when I met Sarah, I prayed 10,000 prayers during that time for God to bring my wife and I together. And it just wasn't happening. But finally, at the age of 51, when I wasn't even looking anymore, accidentally, I met Sarah. It's amazing when you look at the persistence of Elijah's faith here. He kept going back, kept looking over and over again. Your blessing may not come right away. You have to continually, don't stop looking at the horizon. Your blessing will come, but it may not come in a form that you would easily recognize. It may be so tiny and distant at first that it's hard to see it, hard to notice it. There was another um, hope that I've always had in my life, and that's the hope to be a dad. And it's been such a blessing to be able to be Sonia's stepfather. But I also wanted to have children, and I imagined that someday, maybe, I hoped, 
I'd be able to meet someone and have children. And um, when Sarah and I were dating, we, we worked our way through this book called 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged. It's a great book. And uh, the author of the book says, you know, people spend more time shopping for a car than they do um, getting to know their spouse before they get married. There's some important questions you need to ask. I actually um, advise that uh, couples who come to me for premarital counseling read this book. But there are questions in it like, how do you manage your finances? And tell me about your history with your parents. And then one of the questions is, do you want to have children? So Sarah and I were reading through. We got to that question while we were dating. And we discovered that we answered that question very differently. Sarah said, no, I'm done having children. I do not want to have more children. And I said, well, my hope is that, that I'd like to have children someday. And Sarah did something remarkable. She makes these mobiles. And she crafted this mobile. I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of hard to see from that distance. But she made two figures. She makes these out of wire, and then she paints them and hangs them with fish hook. And one of the figures is of Sarah, and one of the figures is of me. And in the middle of the figure of Sarah, she put a round circle representing a womb. And then inside the womb, she put a tiny figurine of a baby. And she said, as I was making this, I was making it to pay attention to how it made me feel when I made it. Did I really, could I even consider that possibility of wanting to have a baby someday? And she said, as I made this, I also was praying about it. And what began to well up in me was this feeling that, yes, I did want to have a baby someday, but not just in the abstract. I wanted to have a baby with you. And then she gave this to me, and she said, hang this up in your apartment. And as you look at it, think about it. Think about whether you really think you want to be a father someday. How does this make you feel when you hang it up? So I did. I hung it up in my apartment, and every morning I'd look at it, and I'd think about it. And for me, it confirmed that I want nothing more than to be a father. It took 28 years for that prayer to be answered. And I can't believe it, but here we are. In six weeks, Sarah's giving birth to a little baby girl. And it's just, to me, just amazing that God's blessing came eventually. But you have to sometimes wait for a very long time for the blessing to materialize. And it doesn't materialize in the way that we think it will. Very often it comes disguised as something we wouldn't even recognize. We had to wait a long time for a new youth director. Warren and Lynette left exactly two years ago. And we were having trouble in our search, so we hired a search firm. And the search firm was doing a national search for a youth director. And they called us up several months ago and told us something very troubling. Our consultant said, you know, I've never had to tell a church this before, and I don't know quite how to break this to you, but we have, we have never seen a job market like this job market. There just aren't enough candidates out there. We just got back from a job fair, and there were some youth candidates, but there are thousands of openings across the country and only just a handful of candidates. And he said, those candidates, they want to go to big churches in other parts of the country, but we can't get anyone interested in a church in New York. He said, uh, I'm not giving up. We're going to continue to try to search. But we became kind of discouraged, like Elijah in that posture of discouragement. It would have been easy to become, to, be, to despair. But then, after a few more months, some candidates, they began to set us, send us some resumes. And they eventually sent us several resumes. And we're so blessed to have found Tim Fennell, who we think is going to be a great match for this church. And he's starting on May 1st. In Hebrews, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, yet not seen. Maybe you've been waiting a long time for a prayer to be answered. Do not give up hope. Keep looking at the horizon. You may not recognize the blessing at first when it appears. And the other thing about the blessing when it appears is very often those blessings are all mixed in with tragedy, with difficulty. So we can't even see it as a blessing. It says in this passage that the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, and a heavy rain started falling. And the Hebrew word here for heavy rain is geshem. 
The Geshem rain is the seasonal heavy rain. And that Geshem rain, when it fell in Israel, was almost always accompanied by thunder and lightning and the darkest clouds you can imagine. Sometimes the blessing is hard to recognize because it's infused with trouble, with other darkness mixed in. I was reading an inspirational story this week about a, a woman named Kimalea who discovered an unexpected blessing wrapped in her tragedy. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2010. She said, I was devastated. I was still grieving the loss of my husband, Gary, who had died young and very suddenly from a heart attack only months before my diagnosis. My life had fallen apart. I was overwhelmed with fear and loss, and I felt that it was beyond all of my ability to control it and to deal with it, to cope with it. Through prayer and faith, my thoughts gradually began to shift, she said, and I came to terms with the fact that I had cancer. I stopped denying it. That was the first step. And then I decided to fight it. So my son and I, we went out and we bought some camouflage gear because I wanted to wear something to remind me that I was at war. I stopped thinking of chemotherapy as my enemy and I began thinking of it as my weapon. My breast cancer was very aggressive. And after a mastectomy, chemotherapy, and radiation, I lost my hair. After two difficult years, my oncologist reported to me with joy in her voice that there was no more evidence of cancer in my body. And yet I was still living in fear, with this looming awareness that at any time the cancer could come back. She said, cancer is not a good thing. But this is what has come out of my cancer, she said. Before cancer, I lived my entire life in fear. Fear of so many things. Fear of speaking up, fear of standing up for myself. Having cancer has taught me that nothing can make me afraid without my permission. And I refuse to give cancer permission. She says, now I live by faith, not by fear. Even in the most difficult circumstances of our lives, my prayer is that you'll be able to keep scanning the horizon, keep looking for the blessing, keep searching for the sign, and you may not recognize it at first, and it may be wrapped in all kinds of other darkness or suffering or difficulty. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and then we enter into Holy Week, the week when we remember Jesus' bold walk to the cross. The disciples, not one of them, understood Jesus' execution on the cross as a blessing, not one of them. And yet it was undeniably the greatest blessing that we could ever imagine. Think about how many billions of people throughout human history have been touched by the cross of Christ, by the awareness that their sin, that their shame has been completely taken away by what happened on the cross. It says in the end of this story that after the heavy rain fell, the power of the Lord came on Elijah and he ran all the way to Jezreel. The Jezreel Valley was a large, fertile plain right at the base of Mount Carmel. And the fertile plain of Jezreel was the breadbasket of Israel, but after three and a half years of drought, it had become a desert. That's where Elijah went. As soon as the rain came, that's where he went. And that name Jezreel means God sows. Who sows the seeds of purpose in your life? God does. Who brings the rain after years of drought and purposelessness and waiting? God does. No matter what you're going through, say with confidence with the psalmist, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope, my soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Your blessing may take years to come, and it may materialize in a way that you never expected, in a way that's not even recognizable, and it may be wrapped in all kinds of other tragedy, but your blessing will come. Let us pray. God, give us the patience to wait for the answer to our prayers. Give us the faith to keep looking, and give us the eyes to see when it begins to emerge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This feast is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. This feast is a foretaste of heaven. And it, it, in and of itself, it may be unrecognizable to us as the blessing that it is. It is such a blessing to commune with Christ at this table. If you've been baptized, and if you desire a closer walk with Jesus, you are welcome to this table. Come, for all things are prepared. Let us lift up our hearts unto the Lord. O oh Lord, you created the heavens and the earth. You have given us life and you preserve us with your blessings. You have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your eternal word, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who became human for us and for our salvation. For this precious gift, we praise and bless your holy name. And with the whole church on earth and the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray that the bread which we break may be to us the communion of the body of Christ, and the cup which we bless the communion of his blood. As this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that thy whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the same night that he was betrayed, took the bread. As he was gathered with his disciples, he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take this as often as you do so in remembrance of me. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. And do we have elders here this morning? Please hold the elements until all have received.
which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Please join me in the prayer which is printed in your bulletin. Since the Lord has now fed us at his table, let us praise his holy name with thanksgiving. And everyone say with mouth and heart, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. And you steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Nor requite us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth. Steadfast love toward those who stand in awe of him. As far as the east is from the west. So far does he remove the transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children. So the Lord has compassion for those who stand in awe of him who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, and will also give us all things with him. Therefore shall my mouth and heart show forth the praise of the Lord from this time forth forevermore. Amen. Amen. The hymn is 641, All the Way My Savior Leads Me.
Maybe your blessing has not come yet. Maybe your prayer has not been answered. Keep looking. Go back and look again. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and through His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever. Amen.